Welcome to the Edge of Faith Essentials podcast. Edge of Faith Essentials is an educational podcast that provides essential information, resources, and tips about education, leadership, and topics about diverse learners. Diverse learners include students with disabilities who receive services under Section 504 or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Response to Intervention and the multi tier System of Support, English Speakers of Other Languages, and Related Diverse Learner Categories. Edge of Faith Essentials mission is to bring positive awareness and promote equity and inclusion in education by sharing information and topics about non-traditional learners. Edge of Faith Essentials goal is to restore faith in education one student at a time by empowering listeners with knowledge because we all know that knowledge is power. So let's be powerful. I am your host, Dr. Nakia, sending you good vibes and thanking you for joining me for another episode of the Edge of Faith Essentials podcast. Thank you for joining me again for another episode of the Edge of Faith Essentials podcast. Let's go ahead and dive in with our Edge of Faith inspirational story for today. Aww. It is fall and we are all about fall festivals and Halloween. What I want to do today is highlight a couple of events that are going on that are celebrating and including adults with and children with special needs. The first inspirational story is about an event and it is a fall festival and it's coming from Livingston, New Jersey and the Livingston Advisory Committee for Disabilities, LACD and the Recreation Department. They're having a upcoming Halloween party for children and adults with special needs. The event is free and it will take place at the Senior Community Center in Livingston, New Jersey on Saturday, October 26th from noon till 2. Guests will enjoy food, beverages, DJ, and arts and crafts, and attendees are encouraged to come and bring a dessert. The next event I want to highlight that's happening for Fall and Fall Festival on October 26th, Red Bank Valley High School will have an event from 9 to 3. That event aims to support the school special education department, and it will have over 40 crafters and vendors. In addition to that, they will have a variety of prizes and made items for sale. There will be items for trick-or-treating, raffles, door prizes, and more. There will be a costume contest available for individuals with intellectual disabilities from 11 to noon and for children ages 1 to 12 from 1 to 2 at that event. Local responders will be there. They'll be there handing out candy. Additionally, there will be a gift basket raffle, a 50-50 drawing, concession stands, and all types of fun to help support the school special education department. If you want to learn more about the Livingston Advisory Committee Halloween Party or the Red Bank Valley High School Fall Festival, I will have those links on the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page, as always. And I want to highlight those stories because they're showing that they're having events and celebrating the fall fun with an inclusive theme to support our inclusive populations and our diverse learners. And that'll be it for our Educate Essentials inspirational story. Now let's shift for our dates to remember for the month of October. October is one of my favorite months along with September for personal reasons with September. But September, October, November, December marks fall. And this is really my favorite time of year with the fall season, the leaves that change, the holidays, and all the wonderful things that happen during the month of October. So let's highlight our dates to remember. Let's look at our month and the things that we're going to celebrate during the month of October. First off is National Principals Month. Make sure that you thank a principal and recognize your principals. It's also National Disability Employment Awareness Month, National Down Syndrome Awareness Month, Careers and Construction Month, Emotional Intelligence Awareness Month, National Bullying Prevention Month, ADHD Awareness Month, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Wear Your Pink for Breast Cancer Awareness, Colon Cancer Awareness Month, Depression Education and Awareness Month, Dwarfism Awareness Month, Dyslexia Awareness Month, Eczema Awareness Month, Selective Mutism Month, Rett Syndrome Awareness Month, Raynard's Awareness Month, Learning Disability Awareness Month, Hispanic Heritage Month that started from mid-September to mid-October. 
Our individual dates include October 2nd is National Custodian Day. Make sure that you recognize your custodians in your building and thank them for keeping our buildings clean and looking out for us and making sure that we're thriving in a clean learning environment, whether you're at a school, district office or whatever. October 2nd is National Custodian Day, so thank a custodian. October 2nd is also Rosh Hasana, and that begins at sunset from October 2nd to the 4th. It is also World Teachers Day, which is October 5th. October 5th is World Teachers Day. October 6th is National Instructional Coach Appreciation Day. If there is an instructional coach in your building, make sure you recognize them and celebrate them for working so hard and coaching our students and our teachers. October 6th is also Fire Prevention Week. That begins October 6th through the 12th. October 6th is also World Cerebral Palsy Awareness Day. October 7th, Child Health Day. October 9th is Pandas, Pans Awareness Day. October 10th is World Mental Health Day globally. October 11th and 12th is Yom Kippur. October 14th is National School Lunch Week, and that is from October 14th through the 18th. October 14th is also Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. October 16th is National Bosses Day. Want to make sure that you celebrate your boss and buy them something nice and recognize them. October 16th is also Unity Day and Stop Bullying Day. October 21st is National School Bus Safety Week. That is October 21st through the 25th. October 23rd through the 31st is National Red Ribbon Week, Drug Free America Day. So make sure that you wear your red and we stay drug free and we recognize staying drug free in America. October 28th is National First Responders Day. Thank you for all that you do in our society. And then we end everything in October with October 31st, which is Halloween. Time for trick or treat, trunk or treat, whatever you like to do where we get spooky, we get candy, we celebrate, and it kicks off the whole fall season. Happy Halloween to everyone who's listening out there. And that will be it for our dates to remember. Time for breaking news. Our first news story is all about EduFaith Educational Services, and EduFaith is on the move. I am pleased to announce that EduFaith will be presenting at the Florida Council for Exceptional Children Conference on October 12th. I will be presenting essential tips for special education leaders. I am a Florida native. I'm very familiar with Florida and the Florida CEC, and it is really full circle, and I'm excited to go present, return home to my home state, and provide our leaders with some essential tips to be successful, to get essential. I will be presenting in Gainesville, Florida, and if you are listening to this podcast and you're part of the Florida CEC, come and see my session. It's from 10 o'clock to 10.50. Come and get essential and learn some tips about special education leadership. I'm also pleased to announce that I will be presenting at the 2025 National Council for Exceptional Children's Conference. I will present essential tips for special education leaders and essential tips for Section 504 coordinators. I will be presenting with EduFaith in my books, both books. We will be in Baltimore, Maryland this year. I think it's from March 12th through the 15th. I will have more information and then you know I will also announce it later on breaking news once we get closer to those dates. I am pleased to announce that both of my proposals have been accepted and I will be presenting once again at the CEC conference and helping collaborate and celebrate our exceptional children and all the wonderful ceremonies and fellowshipping with other special education leaders, parents, educators, and the community in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, of breaking news, there was not a whole lot of information on the Office of Special Education and the site. I updated everything, and the last couple of updates that I saw were from August, so I discussed those on the last episode of Breaking News. But one thing that I do want to point out is that there are a lot of resources from the Office of Special Education Programs. We call it OSEF for short. And under the U.S. Department of Education's um, Office of Special Education Program and Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services, they oversee the implementation of the Individual Disabilities Education Act, also known as IDEA. And as I said, there's not really many updates, but I do want to, I want to share the site resources along with a five minute video that I found explaining OSEP's relationship to the Department of Education and its role in IDEA and how those divisions execute the office mission. This is an excellent resource for parents, educators, and leaders. 
And I always like to read the updates from there and provide you the updates and information of what's going on in our country and what's going on with individuals with disabilities from that site. And I thought it would be great to share that site and share that video as our essential news, just to provide you that information to help you stay connected and stay abreast along with the podcast. And that will be it for our essential news. Now it's time for our essential knowledge. Today, we're going to pick up on part two of our episode where we were talking about mental health because mental health matters, especially since the month of October is Depression Education and Awareness Month. During the month of June, we had Dr. Missy Marsh on the podcast. During that podcast, we discussed suicide prevention and we also discussed depression and stress. Today, we're going to pick up with part two of that podcast. We discussed depression, signs and strategies for counselors, 15 minute focus. And we also discuss stress and education and stress and burnout and education. And we discuss 15 strategies to help you break the stress cycle. It is now the time of year where school has been in session for a couple of weeks. And I feel like this is a great time to capture and discuss depression and stress because now that we've all been in school, things are changing. And as we evolve throughout the year, More tasks come upon teachers, more tasks come upon parents, more tasks come upon leaders. And it's important that we recognize the signs of stress, burnout, mental health, and depression. And it also aligns with the fact that October is Depression Education and Awareness Month. So without further ado, I would like to continue that episode. And I would like to introduce and provide an introduction for my guest, Dr. Missy Marsh, as we Continue with part two of the Mental Health Matters episode of the Edge of Faith Essentials podcast. Dr. Melissa Marsh is an administrator in a metro Atlanta district. She coordinates the development and supervision of school counseling, student advisement, crisis response, and hospital homebound programs. She has 20 years of experience filling the roles of Georgia State High School Counselor, Supervisor of Counseling, and School Counseling and Advisement Consultant. Melissa received her PhD in Counseling Education and Personnel Services and Specialist Degree in School Counseling from the University of Georgia. She received her Advanced Master's in School Counseling from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Marsh has also authored three books in the 15-minute focus series, Suicide Prevention, Intervention, and Postvention, and Depression, Sizes, and Strategies for Counselors, Educators, and Parents, along with her latest workbook titled Stress and Burnout in Education. Missy lives in the Atlanta metro area with her husband and puppies. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling, yoga, cycling, running, hiking, and spending as much time outdoors as possible. I would like to introduce my special guest and friend, Dr. Melissa Marsh. To the Edge of Faith Essentials podcast. Hi, Dr. Cotton. Thank you so much for having me today. So let's go ahead and talk about this book. So we talked about suicide. And now we're talking about depression. Once again, mental health matters. We have to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. When we look at this book, I want to ask the same question. What motivated you to write this book specifically focused on depression? And, for, and you write the book and in the book, particularly from the perspective of counselors and mental health professionals. Yeah. So after the first book and hearing from some of the counselors and them getting the resources, what we were finding is that many of the students that they were dealing with, of course, had diagnosed depression, right? So many of the individuals who are thinking about suicide are either exhibiting parts of depression or are fully diagnosed with depression, which I'm sure we'll talk about shortly. And so my publishing company, which is NCYI, came back to me and asked if I wanted to do a follow-up book specifically about depression since it is most likely that the diagnosis preceding suicidal ideation would be depression. And therefore, we could give more signs, strategies, those kinds of things to really help with the root cause leading to the suicidal ideation. 
that makes sense and that aligns. I like it. Thank um, you. Fortunately, I mean, it's a heavy topic as well, but I can see the depression and the suicide link. Yeah. You know, that's also very powerful. When we think about depression, it can manifest itself in various ways and impact individuals differently. How does your book address the diverse signs and symptoms of depression and what strategies um, can you offer or do you offer in the book to help recognize depression? Well, you are so right. Um, Depression never looks the same for any two individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And so I really begin by sharing some of the requirements for a diagnosis of depression. So just looking at that first, you have to have a minimum of five symptoms during the same two week period that change from previous functioning. So how we were functioning before those two weeks. Um, One of those symptoms has to be that we or the individual is um, experiencing a depressed mood, a loss of interest and pleasure. Mm. So that's one of those five diagnoses. The other diagnoses, though, can be all kinds of things. There's a huge list, right, that meet the criteria. So that's where you might see things like, um, I mean, it can be appetite changes. It can be sleep. It can be agitation. It can be, I mean, there's all kinds of different things. And so that's where really no two people look the same with depression. Uh, One of the things that I share in the book has to do also with the different types of depressive disorders. Mm -hmm. So that when readers are going through this, they're able to not only look at the symptoms and the diagnoses, but the different types of depressive disorders so that they can better understand how depression can manifest differently for each person. Wow. And when you're saying different persons, depression, there's no age limit on depression, right? There is not. There is not. No. So, I mean, we see this, unfortunately, with our elementary school aged students. And then, of course, we see this with our oldest um, seniors. And I don't mean seniors in high school. I mean, like. Our senior age adults. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's 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 just like impactful. And just I'm learning a lot just listening today. And when we think about it. You know, I want to shift to the next question. So in a fast paced world where time is often limited and I feel like that's why a lot of people are depressed because we have so much going on, so much going on in our heads, so many things to juggle in this world. But where time is limited, how do the strategies outlined in your book adapt to the challenge of providing that practical support and intervention within 15 minutes? Because time is everything. Time is everything, right? And the key is that we're not asking the reader to implement therapy. And so that is the big distinction, right? Um, So we're not doing therapy with the student or the client. And many times our readers are not uh, certified or qualified to do therapy anyways. We are trying to provide, or I'm trying to provide in this book, tools for educators, parents, families, friends, Uh, to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of depression and then know how to support their loved ones once they recognize those signs and symptoms. If they are somebody who is in the school setting, how would you support that individual in the school setting? But again, it's not through therapy. So signs and support. I'm always taking notes. Signs and support. Yes. (laughs) So that's what I gathered from that. The book in in the fast-paced world, you have to notice the signs which you provide in the book, but then you offer those supports. You got it. All right. So depression can be complex and multifaceted, just like you mentioned. It can look, you know, it can affect anyone at any age. It can look different in any person. When we think about that and consider that with other mental health issues, How does your book guide counselors in navigating this complexity and providing holistic care for their students? 
I love this question. Um, I'm often asked about the difference between depression and sadness, right? Or even depression mm-hmm. and anxiety. Correct. And it can be challenging for individuals to sometimes differentiate between these. Um, it was interesting at one of the elementary schools recently, they had me come out and do a workshop for parents about the difference between sadness and depression so that they would understand, is my student just feeling sad or are they possibly depressed? Um, And psychologists use a guide that's called the DSM-5, and that Mm -hmm. provides that criteria that I was talking about earlier for diagnosing Mm -hmm. depression or anxiety. Um, And those can actually often be intertwined. So sometimes a person who has depression also has anxiety, right? So you might see them even coexisting, Uh, not always, but they can. In a school setting, though, our counselors or our social workers or our school psychologists, again, wouldn't be providing therapy for students, but they would be supporting this diagnosis. So if if a student has a diagnosis, um, they would be supporting it in the academic setting, uh, maybe helping with coping strategies, uh, perhaps providing accommodations uh, mm-hmm. or additional support if needed, right? You know all about accommodations. Um, yes. So yes. those are the True. kinds of things that we would see and uh, the work that can be guided for counselors specifically in navigating to support. And I want to pivot a little bit because you mentioned the workshop for parents. Let's just tell me a little bit about that because I'm interested in that. Oh, Sure. So um, a principal noticed that she had a number of parents that kept saying, my student is so depressed. My student Mm -hmm. is so depressed. And so she reached out to me and said, can you do a session on depression for my PTSA? And I said, I am glad to. I said, I have a question for you. Do we think that the students are are depressed or do we think that they're sad? And she said, well, gosh, I don't know, right? And this is Mm post-COVID, so many of the students don't have coping skills to begin with. And so we had a beautiful conversation and decided that what her community really needed was the difference between depression and sadness. And depending on which one it was, then how to support their students. So if your student is sad, here are some things that you can do to support them. Or if you truly believe that your student is depressed, here are some things that you could do to support them. Oh, that's powerful. And I love that as well. I think that how did the parents, how how did they receive it? It was very well received. And a lot of it, again, sort of like you mentioned just a little bit ago, was many of them didn't know that there was a difference, right? Mm -hmm. They just felt like depression was heightened sadness, right? And what we like to tell our kids, it's okay to have big emotions, like sadness, Mm -hmm. even big sadness is okay. Um, We just want to make sure that they then have coping strategies, trusted adults to talk to, Mm -hmm. ways then to deal with their big feelings. And you mentioned the pandemic and I didn't even mention that, but I'm glad you brought it up because I know post pandemic has been a struggle for a lot of people, educators, students, parents, everyone. When we look at, you know, as really as we relate to suicide and depression, I know the pandemic brought out a lot of those feelings and actually heightened a lot of that, heightened, you know, the awareness and the feelings of, you know, suicide and depression. So I think pandemic was, you know, very impactful as it relates to that. And I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, absolutely. We, um, you know, saw a lot heightened during it Mm -hmm. and had to sort of respond to it in a very different way than we Mm -hmm. might have ever imagined. 
and mm-hmm. have, you know, continue to see things post pandemic as well. Wow. So when we're looking at some practical tips or techniques from your book that counselors can implement to support clients dealing or not even client students dealing with depression, both in individual sessions and more extensive treatment plans. Did I ask this already? <laughs> you have not. No. I want to make sure. Okay. Um, now, what are some practical tips for our counselors? So, um, and school tips just are they're not just for counselors, but also for teachers, administrators, mm-hmm. anybody mm-hmm. Uh, supporting these students. But um, the one that I really want to stress, the first one, is to partner with parents and families. And I'm sure that you see this all the time, too. Mm-hmm. Um, if the family knows that the school is aware of the situation and is working with them and their student. It allows them to focus on the mental health of their child while, you know, still hopefully allowing them to be successful academically, whatever that looks like in the context of, you know, their mental health diagnosis. Um, But so many times I see that, you know, maybe the school notices that something's going on, but they never reach out to the family to say, we're here to help or hey, I noticed this, are you guys okay? Or, um, you know, there just isn't that sort of partnering. And Mm -hmm. so all of a sudden a student falls through the cracks and then on the back end, the family says, oh, well, you know, they've been in an eating disorder, um, you know, session for months Mm -hmm. and they're depressed and this, that, and the other. And there was no... um, you know, support from the school. So really that partnering with family Mm -hmm. and parents is that number one tip. Um, Again, not just for counselors, but for anybody working with students. Yeah, so I partner with parents. Yes. And communication. So partnering and communication because it takes a village once again. We have to be collaborative. And then when we look at some tips for counselors working with you know in individual sessions you have any strategies when they're working with a student individually I mean there are so many different coping strategies that you can teach students that they can use in the classroom and I think sometimes we as counselors forget um, that our littles right? Our elementary school, but Mm -hmm. even our high school just need those sometimes and asking them what they feel comfortable with, right? Do -hmm. you feel comfortable doing some deep breathing in the middle of the class? Do you feel comfortable doing some visualization, right? Things that other people can't see you doing, but that when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you are needing just to take a moment that you could do at your desk or Would you feel comfortable if you had a pass to go see one of your trusted adults? Would you feel comfortable leaving the classroom, right? What are some ways that we can help you to navigate this in a school setting? And let that student be part of the discussion, right? Not, again, just the counselor and or the parent, right? Even our elementary school students can say, yeah, I can do that or no, I can't do that. Love it. So coping skills and ownership, taking ownership of those coping skills is is what I'm gathering is very important when you're working with your students and your your children in the classrooms and at home. Yes. So let's let's talk about some let's discuss some essential tips for parents. So what are maybe two essential tips for parents that you can provide, whether it is a self struggle or if they're you know, struggling and working and supporting their child with depression? Well, that first um, answer is going to be the exact same one that I said for the school. (laughs) Uh, It is not just the school's responsibility to reach out to the family. The parents have to tell the school what's going on with the student. So if a student is diagnosed with depression, again, you don't have to give all the nitty gritty details, but the teachers, the counselor, the administrator, they are there to help your student. And if they know what the student is struggling with, 
they're able to put protocols in place, potentially accommodations to best support your student. So again, you need to be communicating with the mm-hmm. school to best help your student. So that's exactly. the number one. Okay. So I said coping and communication once yep. again. And yep. what was the second one? What and the second one is going to be to get help early. So mm-hmm. there is definitely still that stigma with depression as with mm-hmm. other uh, mental illness. Mm-hmm. And many times we don't want to get treatment, right? Whether we don't mm-hmm. want to put our students on medication, whether we don't want to go to counseling. Um, and the research shows the best way to address depression is a combination of talk therapy, so counseling and medication. It doesn't mean that you have to be on medication for the rest of your life, but that is the best combination. And so get help early. Do not ignore the symptoms and work with whether it's your primary care physician um, to get other professionals in your life or work with the counselor at school to get the right professionals to help make this a smoother process for you and your family. So get help early. Don't ignore the systems. Talk through therapy and acknowledge it. You got it. Awesome. All right. Look at let's discuss our educators and our leaders in school personnel. What are two essential tips that you would provide to us? Yes. (laughs) When addressing Um, depression personally, because it's been a lot going on for educators, most of them. But then also working with students as well. So when you're working with students or even with your fellow educators, be aware of what the symptoms of depression are, right? So if you notice weight change, if you notice fatigue, if you notice all of a sudden that there's a personality shift, be aware of what those signs of depression are and don't ignore the signs and symptoms. And reach out to that individual and again, share that you have concerns and that you care about them. Um, If it is yourself, also Mm -hmm. recognize those signs and symptoms in yourself, which is sometimes really hard to do. Um, And again, the sooner that you get professional help, the smoother this process will be. Um, for educators specifically, burnout is real. Mm -hmm. And when depression is not treated, it can lead to greater mental health issues, including suicidal ideation, but also other health complications as well. So I would just suggest both for your students, but also for yourself, just take care of yourself and really try to take care of each other. Awesome. I think the big takeaway for this is, or for me and listening is that depression is not a phase. It's something that has to be addressed Yes. in order to get better. Absolutely. And it's treatable. Depression is treatable. I've learned quite a bit, especially with the, the did you say two weeks of the behavior? So that two was- Two weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was very informative. And I took notes on that. So that was very, very good information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's shift to third book. They all align with each other. They do. You're seeing a theme here. We are seeing a theme, but it is a much needed theme in our society, which is why we're discussing it today. We're having those crucial conversations about the things that we need to talk about in our society that impacts our students, impacts our educators, our parents, and our leaders. And that's why we're here. The next book is Stress and Burnout in Education, 15 Strategies. You like 15. 15 Strategies to Help You Break the Stress Cycle. And that is your third book that you have. And we talked about suicide. We talked about depression. And now we're talking about stress because, as you mentioned, stress can lead to suicide. I'm sorry. Stress can lead to depression. Depression can lead to suicide. Let's talk about that book first question once again what inspired you to write stress and burnout within the education sector and how does your book address the unique challenges educators face so 
This one really stemmed from our return from COVID. Clearly, mm-hmm. we were all very stressed out. Um, I'm agreeing with you 100%, not to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I was seeing amazing educators and counselors who were really struggling with stress. And uh, it was really the first time that I was seeing it truly lead to burnout in a different uh, way. Um, and in addition to the staff, the students were incredibly stressed, but for the first time as a whole, didn't seem to have the coping skills to deal with their stress, which was then adding additional stress to our amazing educators who didn't have the tools already to deal with the students who didn't have coping strategies. So there was like this weird cyclical effect. Yes. And so that's kind of how this foundation for the third book was formed. It sounds like a trickle down effect or, or the you know, cards. You have the cards up and once one card fall <laughs> and then the other card fall. So it that's it exactly. Like- that's it exactly. Wow. And I agree with you. You know, we I still feel like as educators, pandemic is still the the impact of the pandemic is still strong and there's still a, a lot of burnout and stress. But there I, is. Mm-hmm. There is for sure. I can just share with you from a, a personal level. Mm-hmm. I have felt it myself, mm-hmm. um, the stress in ways that I never have before. And I've seen it in friends, colleagues, loved ones. Um, and for even those of us that know and teach about coping strategies, Mm -hmm. right. And how to, um, reduce stress, not always being able to as quickly kind of pull at those strategies like we usually would. Yeah. So it's just the struggle (laughs) with the strategies at this point. Absolutely. Interesting. Well, stress and burnout can profoundly affect just what you said, uh, educators' well-being and job performance. You mentioned it. Some of the best educators were impacted or are impacted by stress mm-hmm. and burnout. Could you share some of the critical signs and symptoms discussed in your book and then some maybe strategies to help educators recognize and manage these challenges? Yes. Um, so there are many symptoms of stress. Um Some of the warning signs, though, that we might see um, specifically at work, right, and and in our field, um, but across the board. So persistent exhaustion, um, starting to feel indifferent or less connected, and that can be to the work or to things that we used to enjoy or to colleagues, um, being forgetful, uh, Having changes in your body, and that can be anything from headaches, stomach aches, um, changes in sleep, appetite, anything like that. So those would be some of the warning signs that you might just want to watch for. And then what about some strategies? So um, in the book, each chapter is a different strategy that can be implemented. And it's interesting, hopefully, because the way that I wrote it is that it can be implemented by staff in a classroom setting, Mm. in a group setting, or in an individual setting. And the strategies can also be implemented with students or with staff who are needing stress-reducing techniques. So some of my favorite strategies that you'll find in the book. Mm -hmm. um, The first one is I love the stress profile. Um, This one really kind of sets the groundwork for a person's stressors, stress level, kind of what's our starting point. Okay. Um, One of my other favorites is the energy management audit. So this one really focuses, I know, right? It's sort of a mouthful, but uh, focuses on where a person is utilizing their energy um, or spending their energy and how does this help or hinder 
our stress levels. Um, I love the stress journal, which when you say this, most people think, oh, I journal or I've tried journaling or that doesn't work for me. But um, this specific activity is actually journaling a person's stress. And I give some templates for it. So what was a stressful situation? Who was present? What was your reaction to it? So it asks a series of questions to help you start to realize what are those stressors in your life? And then how can those maybe be removed or reduced? I love it. So 15 strategies. Could you highlight, a few, well, you just highlighted a few, but could you discuss how they could be implemented effectively by educators and school administrators? Because our school administrators have to take care of their teachers. So yeah. how can they implement these strategies? So it's funny, when I was writing this book, I had a department at Central Office that felt like they were incredibly stressed. And mm -hmm. the director would invite me to their monthly meetings and ask me to do stress reducing techniques with them. So I had an hour each month with this amazing department. I love it. And so what I would do is try out these different activities with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying them with educators. Um, and then they would give me feedback on it. What worked? What didn't work? What would they have liked to see differently? And so it's nice because I have tried these specifically with educators and that's how school administrators can use them. You can use them at professional development, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether it's in a large group or whether it's in a small group, or maybe it's with your PLC, or maybe you just have an individual that's stressed out and you need, you know, to give them a, Hey, have you thought about trying something like this? Right. Or maybe they're struggling with a student who's stressed and they need a suggestion for something else, right? Mm -hmm. um, but each strategy also has different adaptations that go along with it. There's downloadable resources, there's templates. So hopefully it makes them very user-friendly for the administrator, the teacher, the counselor, whoever is implementing it, whether it's in a classroom setting, a PLC, um, a group, or one-on-one. -on -one. Awesome. And when you said that and you mentioned that, I do, I am noticing now a lot of schools are having like Zen rooms for educators. Yes. And those things to help support stress release. And I That's love it. it. Exactly. And it's amazing. So this is something, you know, that coincides with that. I love it. And we need Zen rooms. Educators need Zen rooms. Educators often face high pressure, responsibilities, and just a lot of tasks, a lot of multitasking, a lot of fast moving parts in education as educators, leaders. How does your book equip, edu equip educators with the resilience and coping skills to navigate the challenges that may lead to burnout? Mm -hmm. So this book is specifically designed to provide educators, uh, any educators, with the tools and techniques um, that they can use to teach students who don't have those coping skills for dealing with stress. Um, or again, to use uh, when they themselves are experiencing stress. So the more that the techniques are implemented, either by the students or by the staff members, the more likely that they're going to become incorporated into a routine, which is going to then help lower stress and in the long run, reduce burnout. So building those healthy habits. So I'm thinking and I'm listening. So tools, techniques, and teaching. Mm -hmm. And building all those things, or those three things will build those healthy habits. Yeah. Very good. good stuff. All right. So collaboration and support within the school community is also essential when addressing stress and burnout. How does your book encourage educators to prioritize self-care 
and create a supportive environment for themselves and their colleagues because it takes a village there too. It does for sure. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, any of these strategies can be conducted with educators. Um, Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, I was able to do it with a large group, but I've also had individuals who have reached out to me and said, you know, I'm really stressed out um, and was wondering if you could come do just some one-on-one work with me. And I do that with our colleagues. And many times I will say, do you know what is stressing you out? Or do you know where you're spending your time? Or do you know, and they can't answer those kinds of questions. And so I'll turn to the strategies that are in this book and give them activities so that they can better identify their stressors or better identify why they're feeling stressed by a particular stressor or how they could better use their time. So there's lots of different activities so that we're also not spinning our wheels trying to self-care. Wow. That's that's awesome. And that's great information. And it's for the for us as educators or for themselves, but also collaborating and supporting each other. And I like that you said that and identifying the why and how we can make those changes. And just have the, the fact that your book has those tangible resources that someone can implement and follow through and help cope with stress and burnout. I love that. Thanks. I'm not trying to make it hard for anybody, right? Like here's the resource, Mm -hmm. just open Mm -hmm. it up and use it. I love it. And and in this world and in this society, we need ease because if it's work, people are not going to want to do it, but if it's right there for you, you know, you can use it and it's accessible and we love accessibility. As we close out, I want to, I know we're talking about educators and stress and burnout, but parents burn out too. What are two essential tips that you could provide for parents about stress and burnout? Um, I would say for parents that stress is normal for students of all ages, right? Again, even our elementary school students. Uh, However, our students need to learn those uh, strategies for coping with their stress. Um, that they can use in all settings, right? Including school. So some of these uh, strategies that they could take into the classroom when they're feeling stressed, maybe they could take into other environments where they have to be quiet, or maybe they could take into their soccer team, right? Or they could take into whatever environment it is, but learning those coping strategies for life. So that would be my first tip. Um, The second tip is that parents can remember that they can partner with their school counselors, right, or other support staff in the building for other coping strategies uh, that might be helpful. So if they've just never asked and think that your student is stressed, um, I mean, beyond (laughs) regular stress, then ask your counselor for some tips and tricks and different coping strategies that might be helpful to teach your student if they're struggling because your counselors are great resources. I love the collaboration and I love the fact that you're pushing collaboration. I love it. And then let's look at our educators and leaders. The book is aimed towards, you know, stress and burnout in education. But if you had to highlight two essential tips for educators and leaders about stress and burnout, what would you tell us? (laughs) um so I would say sort of like when we were talking about depression earlier Mm -hmm. I would encourage educators and leaders because I think leaders uh, do this often but don't ignore your own stress um and the stress of the people that you work with or maybe the people that you supervise um in addition to your students of course it's important to try to have a pulse on this and Mm -hmm. to respond appropriately as needed. Um, When our stress goes on for long periods of time, it can have long-term impacts on our health um, and eventually that stress will lead to burnout. 
Very good. So for parents, you want to work and teach those lifelong coping skills. And then you want to pair up and partner with your school counselors to have those resources and support to help support stress and burnout. And then for our educators and leaders, we can't ignore it. We have to face it. And then we have to respond to those things that are causing stress and also implement coping skills so it doesn't affect us physically over time. Very good. All right. So as we close out, awesome, great information. And I knew you were going to be fabulous. If I was to ask with your background, what maybe one more final essential tip for parents? Just one. What would you tell parents about all three topics or, you know, just a general topic or tip based on your background? I would encourage parents to take note when things change in your students. You know your students the best. And when you notice a major change happening, that is probably a red flag or a warning that something might be amiss. And don't sit on it for very long until you consult with somebody else um, that's not just a friend, um, but get the the help that you need for your students. Awesome. I think that's a, a great takeaway from the information that we discussed today and all of the books. And then when we're looking at leaders and educators, what's one essential tip that you would leave with leaders and educators about, you know, all of the topics that we've discussed, your books and everything with your background? Um, I would encourage our educators and our leaders to collaborate. Uh, You all do so much in our buildings and you are amazing. And if we can collaborate and work together, especially with our parents and with our students, And with each other, especially when, again, we are noticing changes with um, our colleagues or with students. If we see that something's awry, again, we can hopefully uh, get to a solution before the problem gets too big. Awesome. I love it. I think that's great information. And then... We want to leave our listeners with how to get in contact with you and how to access your books. So you want to give us a little background and tell everyone how they can locate your books and your resources. And of course, I will have this on the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page and in the, on my on my website, on the Edge of Faith Consulting website page. But I wanted you to just talk about your resources and where individuals and our listeners can contact you. Thank you. Um, I do work with NCYI, the National Center for Youth Issues. They're an amazing um, organization. And so I have a variety of topics that I speak on nationally. If you're interested in any of that information, you can go to the link that's provided here and see all of the different topics that I speak on. You can also see more information on the three books that I was able to share on with Dr. Cotton's podcast. The books are also available on Amazon as Dr. Cotton has been so kind to note here as well. So I appreciate um, her willingness to share this information and um, the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. I have enjoyed having you here and you are a near dear friend and colleague and the book is not only at Amazon. I just mentioned Amazon, but she has books everywhere. So go ahead and tell us where else we can find your wonderful books because they are much needed in our society. Oh, you're so sweet. Um, I mean, you can get them directly from NCYI. That might be one of the easiest ways if you just use that link right there, Um, but they are available in a variety of bookstores as well. So if you just Google them, you can easily find any of the various links for any of the books. And I want to thank you for being here. I have truly enjoyed listening. And although the topics are heavy, the way you presented them, 
just was phenomenal. So thank you for being on the Edge of Faith Essentials podcast. Thank you for sharing the information. And listeners, please secure a copy of the book. Grab all three books, as, as a matter of fact, not one book. Get you a copy of all three. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. And I do feel like we have to continue to have these conversations, even when it's uncomfortable, because mental health matters. Thank you so much, Dr. Missy Marsh, for being on my podcast. Thanks, Dr. Cotton. This was so much fun being with you today. Thank you. For our words of wisdom for this episode, I want to leave you with a quote that aligns with the episode. And it is, every one of us needs to show how much we care for each other and in the process, care for ourselves. And that quote comes from the beautiful Princess Diana, Princess of Wales. May she rest in peace. I always love Princess Diana and she is she was really a woman of wisdom. So as we look at and discuss the pressure, the stress and how it impacts our lives, let's remember that we must care for ourselves as we care for others. I want to encourage you to get essential and subscribe to the Edge of Faith Consulting website. Subscribe at www.edgeoffaithconsulting.com. I have a monthly newsletter and a blog, and I want to encourage you to subscribe to the Edge of Faith Essentials YouTube page. As always, thank you for all of your support, and let's continue to get essential. You've got me. Now it's time for our essential advice. Ask Dr. Nakia or share an inspirational story. I want to use this platform to support and spotlight fellow educators, families, and community members. If you have a question, want advice, or to share a wonderful inspirational story on this podcast, feel free to email me at edufaithforall at gmail.com. That is E-D-U-F-A-I-T-H, the number four, A-L-L, at gmail.com. May read your letter, provide advice, or share your story on this podcast. Disclaimer, all listeners should adhere to district policies, follow protocols, remain ethical, and adhere to guidelines in the best interest of children. Educate Essentials does not assume responsibility or is legally responsible for anyone's actions based on information provided on this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Edufaith Educational Services. Some services offered through Edufaith Consulting include consulting and advocacy for parents, consulting for educators, leaders, and school districts, college accommodation advocacy, consulting and training, advocacy in supporting individuals with college accommodations at the post-secondary level, as well as university trainings to support individuals with disabilities and services parent education trainings, college and career coaching for students who are entering the workforce or the post-secondary college setting, business and district professional development and trainings for churches, nonprofits, businesses, districts, and communities, specializing in services for diverse learners, including students with disabilities, interventions under the multi-tier system of support, English speakers of other languages, education and leadership coaching, program development under services under IDEA, Section 504, trainings, diverse learners, and essential tips books. Feel free to go to www.edufaithconsulting.com to view all the services that Edufaith Educational Services. I want to encourage my believers to be blessed. All others, be kind, be well, and be the change. Follow Edufaith on social media. Twitter, Edufaith S. On Instagram, Edufaith 2021. On LinkedIn, Edufaith Educational Services. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting Edufaith Educational Services and the Edufaith Essentials Podcast. Subscribe and follow Edufaith Essentials on the Edufaith Essentials YouTube page and listen to the Edufaith Essentials Podcast on all streaming platforms. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. Have a wonderful day and get essential.